Hello and welcome. Um, this session is on how to be an inclusive leader. I'm Patrick Jenkins, the deputy editor here at the FT, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, my panel. Um, Pregya Agarwal is an author and behavioural scientist. Kenny James is chief executive of Direct Line. Silke Munster is chief diversity officer at PMI, and uh, Keith Skiok. Um, is chairman of Aberdeen Standard Investments Research Unit. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I suppose this is the kind of uh, the big question, really, um, uh, uh, at the heart of uh, the advancement of um, of men, but also other diverse groups um, into senior positions in in business. Um, how to be an inclusive leader. Um, Pragya, this is the kind of stuff that you've written about extensively. Um, so give us your recipe to start us off. Thank you, Patrick. Um, hope you can hear me. Um, so in terms of how do we define an inclusive leader and how do we become one, I think some people have to start with the notion of inclusivity and what it really means to them, because inclusivity at the moment can sometimes be confused with diversity being diverse and including people or having different kinds of people in nice doesn't necessarily make it inclusive. Because inclusively, first of all, has to, I think, unlearn some of their own biases, some of the things that they've been conditioned um, and they've been ingrained in them. So first of all, you unlearn the biases, being, being aware of them is, I think, the first step. And then being very active and intentional about how do we address some of these biases within ourselves and also within the organization. How do we create non-judgmental spaces where people can report some of the microaggressions that they might face, some of the biases they might encounter? How do we create non-judgmental spaces where or and mechanisms for people to not only report but also come and unlearn some of their biases as well? And um, I think being being taking being active about it, being intentional, but also then taking action and setting long term and short term goals for the organization, for the team, um, in terms of clear set of values about inclusivity, I think is really important. Uh, thank you, Pragya. Um, Keith, um, you're someone who's had a, a long career in the financial services industry. Um, and your latest uh, role is just um, the, the, the most recent of a number of leadership positions, um, notably uh, previously you were chief executive of um, Standard Life Aberdeen. Um, tell me how you have changed over your career and ha how your perception of the importance of, of this uh, whole topic of inclusivity and being, in being an inclusive leader has, has changed you. Um, I, and thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I've, I've had nearly um, you know, coming up for 41 years in the industry. So I've seen a phenomenal amount of change. And I must say, uh, most of it for the better. Uh, the two things that I think have, have really kind of struck a chord, uh, really from the financial crisis and through the corona crisis is that people are now accepting that you know inclusion is important. The only way you make a real difference is by being authentic. And um, I had a very old colleague who used to say to me, um, you know, you've got one of these and two of these, and, and actually you should use them in uh, in proportion. And that listening and bringing people in, I think, is 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 really quite a big change. I mean, as well as time, I think it's also, you know, in my career, I've worked uh, for the government, I've worked in a partnership, I've worked in a mutual, and of course, most recently, I've worked and had leadership roles within a PLC. I think the biggest change by far is the gradual acceptance that within, you know, the, the public listed world, that inclusion is important that targets are uh, important because actually getting inclusion in is a means to generating much better and stronger, uh, stronger, uh, stronger performance. I don't think we're there yet. I think we've got a huge way to go, but I think there has been phenomenal change over the last 40 years or so. 
Um, just before I move on, I, I just wanted to pick pick up on on you used a, a really uh, good um, management buzzword earlier in your comment, um, being authentic. Um, what does that actually mean to you? I think it's about it, it's really about two things. Um, one, it's kind of recognizing, unlike the nineteen. 19- and 1990s version of corporate leadership, that it's not just about you, it's about your people uh, and and letting them in. But also uh, being authentic is stepping away from those corporate buzzwords and actually you know, uh, leading through your own values and displaying your own values. And to some extent also, um, accepting that those values are only visible when actually you open up and, and, and show that you have vulnerabilities uh, as, uh, as well. And, and, and you're part of a broader team of making stuff happen rather than some superman or superwoman that's ma- waving a magic corporate wand. Um sounds like someone who uh, is in the White House right now. Uh, uh, we can come back to that comparison in a second, but um, let's move on to, um, let's move on to Silver. Um, everything that Keith has said um, will resonate, I'm sure, with many people, but um, how much more difficult has that mission been uh, over the past six or seven months when uh, we've been in the middle of a pandemic and um, management challenges uh, and arguably, particularly as they relate to the kind of um, empowerment of women agenda, have become uh, that much greater. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Patrick, for the question. Um, I took my position actually the first day of the lockdown in Switzerland was the first day I, I took the role as chief diversity officer, um, and I, it became very clear in in the first day that inclusive leadership it will be important for us to get successful to the crisis. So one of the first jobs which I did was communicating to managers of all different levels uh, that it will be really important to be an inclusive leader and to step up to this challenge during the crisis and to talk to their teams frequently and personally. And and I have to say um, uh, very positively received and and the results we got we did two surveys with with employees and we got very positive feedback so managers actually did so and and we had recently a, a new pulse survey where our employee net promoter score went up significantly and i think this is because managers really took the challenge and were as as uh, inclusive and I think very important here was also that they are authentic to that extent that they are not only doing a tick the box exercise, but they were asked to ask people for their personal situation and especially parents, not only mothers, but also fathers for their personal situation and, and their schedules and their availability to make sure that, that people uh, are not burdened too much and, and that they can manage homeschooling and and uh, and at the same time so that was i think very important also for the the mothers of course and females uh, in the organization uh, uh, to to carry on and and continue with their work um penny as, as silka says um many women have have been harder hit both through the kind of you know juggling challenges um but also i think there's data showing more job losses have been uh, among women uh, as well. So what's your take on, the, on this and, and how have you kind of tackled uh, the, the, the special challenges over the lockdown period? Well, well, I think uh, I mean, we know that um, through lockdown, sort of mums have only been able to do, for every hour of uninterrupted uninter- work that mums have been able to do, dads have been able to do three hours. So we kind of know that it doesn't, evenly um, uh, across across the genders in terms of the strain. Um, but actually, the thing, uh, I actually think in the long run, um, much as there are horrific things, is an opportunity there as well, is that they are, 75% of them don't want to work in an office full-time in the future. 
and we grab that as employers and we have a real opportunity to change the way the working model works and give greater flexibility to people, which could in the long run be a real benefit to some of those same lockdown itself. Um, I think in terms just a bit of one of Silka's points, there's also been a real shift in emphasis through lockdown. So one of the key things has been communication um, and kind of brings and, and Silka points together. And we've been talking at times weekly with 3,000 people on the phone. Um, and half of that conversation has been me sharing everything I could share um, and trying to be myself in doing so. But half of that conversation been people sharing what they're feeling um, and part of authentic leadership is uh, confident enough to let that two-way conversation really open up um, and if you can bring the conversation about diversity um, whether it's black lives or gender into the heart of that open debate then you've got a real chance of getting a cultural movement behind it. It's, it's just a follow-up with you Penny I mean it sounds from your description as if being a, a chief executive these days is is as much about kind of being a therapist as it is about being a leader. Uh, I, I'm not sure therapist is fair, but but surely the job is really to create an environment where people can thrive and in particular talent can thrive. Um, and you can only do that if you know what people are thinking. Um, and you have to make sure that they believe or I believe that they have to know that their views matter. Um, uh, as my, you know, as much as mine do. Uh, sadly, I wasn't blessed with having all the answers in the world. So I need people around me who I think can help create the right answers. Very good, um, Pragya. Could I come back to you because I know you've you've written in your um, in your book uh, Sway, I think, about the kind of um, the way in which workplace cultures can kind of down into in groups and out groups, and I just wondered. Talking here in the context of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the working practices that have followed it, and the um, the norm uh, of now video calls um, uh, being the way that we interact, but also in some cases, a small groups of people being in the office. I wonder whether you feel there's a there's a there's a real risk here. I'm speaking to you from the FT office today, um, uh, but I'm among you know only two dozen people here everybody else several hundred people are working from home does that is there a risk that you get an in-group who are in the office uh and making all the big decisions and an out-group who are is everybody else who is kind of kind of connected but not that is an interesting question because as you say we all have this instinct um, to have in-groups and out-groups and i think workplace culture sometimes develops in a way that cliques are formed and there are certain people who, because of confirmation bias, fall back into these these kind of groups where they 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 associate with people who are more like them or who think like them and talk like them, and then they that can create a real feeling of othering or lack of belonging for some people who fall out group. I, I think it's an interesting question about how the virtual working would change that because on one hand I feel like workplaces are becoming maybe more inclusive and everybody's on a par because everybody's working from home now and everybody's connected through virtual environment, especially during lockdown. Um, and even though we have our context different and our place environment at home is different and our lack of accessibility and our emotional and mental load and childcare and all that is different. Um, I think it, it, it prevents those kind of in-group, out-group mentalities that can develop in workplace and how certain people can feel othered. Um, I think as we are going, moving towards some people being in the office and some people being at home, um, there is a risk that that can happen, that people who are in the workplace might be more influential or might be more involved in, in, and engaged in what's happening in the workplace, or they might be um, more up to the news, recent news. So I think it's really up to the workplaces to, to make sure that this kind of uh, uh, difference doesn't happen, these kind of group mentality doesn't get reinforced and forged by these divisions that people who are working in the office are seen to be more engaged. It's not just that they're engaged, they might be perceived to be more engaged or might perceive to be more active or proactive or more serious about their careers. And people who work from home might be seen to be 
less serious because they have other child care or other caring responsibilities or other health issues. So I think it's really up to the leaders and it's about the workplaces to make sure that these things are not happening, that that there is equity amongst everybody, even if they are not in the office. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Can I just quickly come back to Penny with that thought um, and, and how, just briefly, if you could, how, how you've dealt with that, if, if you if you perceive it as a risk, if you like this kind of, you know, home uh, office. Uh, 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 I think we're at a really interesting point. I mean, through lockdown, most of us have been at home, other than people who are literally mending cars. Um, everybody has been working from home and it's been actually, I think, a real leveler and it's actually led to more collaboration people have found themselves mixing groups in a, in a much less hierarchical way. So there've been curiously and unexpectedly perhaps some real benefits. Um, I think we're really thoughtful about as we come back to the office, especially as we're starting to look at a much more flexible and mixed basis of working, about the fact that people will need touch points together over time physically to keep, uh, to keep that sort of sense of inclusivity uh, um, going. And we're also very thoughtful about how you chair mixed kind of mixed media meetings. So certainly not having all the senior people in one place at one time, um, but also how when you're on a video call like this, you can make sure that you're including people in the room evenly with those who are on uh, on on media. I don't know the answers yet, but we need to bank the positives from the experience we've been through uh, and make sure we kind of, uh, roll those into the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Keith, can I pick up on something that you uh, mentioned uh, earlier, which is the, the kind of authenticity point and how actions are more important than than words. If you have to think back over your career, um, or perhaps recent or, or, or long time ago, I, I don't know, um, but just pick, pick out a, an instance for us of, you know, an action that you took um, that was really important from, from an inclusivity point of view. So, I, 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 yeah, and, and I think I can give you um, two examples, one from a, a, a little while ago, which I think plays to what, uh, what Penny was, uh, was talking about. Um, you know, certainly when we were engaging in uh, a period of, 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 of quite profound transformation, you, it, it's really important that you communicate well and you get the diversity of, uh, the diversity of thought. Uh, and you step away from corporate spin. So I think it's really important to create a safe space so that people can speak up in a in a in a in a manner that um, you know where they're where they're not just towing the corporate line. So one of the things I've done several times in my career is everybody knows where the elephant in the room is, uh, and you know, at town halls, whether it's uh, in person or on video, is actually work out where that elephant in the room is and get somebody actually to ask that question early, make that point of view straight up, and you respond to it in an inclusive uh, in an inclusive manner. Uh, you celebrate the fact that there's a difficult question being asked and it's being called out. And actually, that makes it safe uh, for, for people, to, uh, people to comment. Uh, during the coronavirus, you know, with so much uncertainty and, and, and people concerned about uh, where information was, was coming from, I think we did, uh, we did two things. One we attempted in a pretty open and transparent manner to provide a golden thread of information and communication uh, where people could rely on what we were uh, saying and we were taking best practice from around the world as opposed to just listening to um, either the UK government or the Scottish uh, government. And then we used technology to run pulse surveys and allowed uh, anonymous question and comment coming in with those pulse surveys celebrated then where um, somebody was raising an issue and taking action and being you know um, able to sort that out whether that was just 
allow me safely to take a chair from the office to home or to provide money for cabling around the laptop, those small things kind of made a difference. And what it did do is it, it, it empowered and it made inclusive teams to take that action and flow it up so we could get stuff uh we could get stuff uh we we could get stuff done and and actually you know the proof of the puddings in in the eating on some of this stuff and our and our pulse surveys we went from pretty low engagement scores to uh, net promoter schools we're in the uh the 80s so and and and, and actually you can just see that, that people want to contribute and where they can, they will. So it, it's, it's about opening, opening those doors, opening those, uh, those, those, those conduits. Sounds a bit like motherhood and apple pie, but at the end of the day, there are hard actions which benefit uh, uh, somebody. And, and, and one of the things that, that I think has been quite important to me uh, and I've learned over, over, over the last really year, and it's been accelerated by the coronavirus, something again that Penny and I think Silka alluded to, um, actually understanding the problems faces, faced by families is incredibly important to the corporate world. If we're going to rebuild trust, we need to rebuild trust with the next generation. And that actually means that as well as those people that work for us or partners that are work for us, the, the kids have to see something being done for them. Yeah, quite. Um, sorry, Penny, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I was just going to build on, on that point about trust uh, and perhaps give a, 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 an example here, because this is not an always a comfortable game. Um, uh, so we have over the course of, of lockdown, actually, um, uh, sort of post the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests, uh, done a full diversity survey and got something like six and a half thousand of our 10,000 people uh, responding. So a, a strong response rate. Um, but the big thing in there, whilst lots and lots of our, our people uh, have a great experience um, uh, and generally actually our women uh, responded really strongly, um, our black colleagues and our Sikh colleagues did not share that experience. Um, and the challenging thing, I think, and the action around it is we have shared all of those results with all of our people, um, uh, the good and the bad, and some of the examples that bring that to life. And we've talked about them with our board, we've talked about them with our senior management teams, we've talked about it on our all colleague calls, we've talked about it at our exco, and we've explained what our planning action plans are. Um, and the real thing here is about trust, that people believe that they will, you know, they'll be heard and believe that it makes a difference. Um, so anything you can do tangibly in that space to build, keep building on that trust and include them in designing answers. Most people in this world want a fair world for everybody. It's about empowering them to get there um, and building that trust. Yeah. Silke, have you, have you got any uh, insights to offer in, in this area? I, I can only agree. It's super important, and and the same is true for for what you discussed earlier uh, about uh, uh, remote work. And I think it is there also super important that we have senior management as role models, and and that to the point, uh, I think it's not senior management who's sitting in the office and all the others are, are working from from home, uh, but that you have senior managers also working from home and and. So this has worked quite well here, but um, um, and and we have another rule actually for which is important uh, f going forward. We will have a hybrid model as well, which we announced, where you have maximum flexibility for employees to choose where they want to work from. But one thing that you can't choose, and it is, if only one person is connected remotely, uh, then the whole meeting has to happen remotely and has to happen virtually. So it's not going to happen that you have two people sitting in a room and, and three people connected because then very soon we will have this in and out group and the ones being in the office uh, are, are privileged, so to speak, and the ones who are working remotely will want to come back to have the same privilege. So I think that that was a very important rule for us um, and, and that's something where people don't have a choice. That's a really important example. Um, just before we carry on, I, I just want to re remind our viewers that um, 
they are free to pose questions to the panel. Um, just uh, submit them uh, and I will pick a few uh, to pose um, and uh, we'll, we'll do that in the next few minutes. Um, uh, can I stay with you, Silke, because there's, I wanted to ask your view on um, on the, the, the topic of performance, because we've talked um, in very uplifting terms about, you know, doing the right thing and improving the lot of staff and so on. Um, but how does this link through to performance? Yeah. Whether I, we're talking I, about profit, I, I, price or, or whatever trick we're going to use. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's, if, if you want to really embed inclusive leading and make sure that managers adopt inclusive behavior. I think it's always important that we communicate the business case behind again and again. Um, and we know that employees who feel a strong sense of belonging show 56% higher job performance. And therefore, inclusive leadership is not uh, a nice to have, but it's a business imperative. And in order to be successful, uh, we we need this, and especially in times of crisis or li like PMI going through through a dramatic transformation, uh, we need inclusive leadership at all level, and and actually also we need this to be reflected in the KPIs for for managers. In you know, order to make this change sustainable, they need to be measured against their uh, leadership style and the inclusivity they bring to their teams. Pragya, does does your analysis of um, um, behavioral science from, from that aspect support this view that it's actually um, uh, not only a nice to have but a must have from a kind of corporate performance point of view? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think a sense of belonging is really important in terms of retention as well. So we see often di diversity is seen as kind of a performative thing sometimes in organizations where just the intake is measured, where how many diverse or groups and um, people are being hired into an organization. Um, but how, how the leadership can move those people up to a higher level to to through the ranks and actually retain them is often becomes an issue. And that can happen only if the, the workplace culture is where everybody feels belong a sense of belonging, where the people are happy. It also affects people's mental health. And I think we're talking so much about workplace mental health and workplace well-being that I think it's a really, really crucial element of it about a sense of belonging. And so inclusive leadership is also about how to encourage people to move up the ranks, to include them, not just in, in kind of uh, decision making, but also about their sense of promotion as well, having clear, transparent indicators and guidelines for promotion so that they know how they can move up. And so they not only just have a seat at the table, but they can have a voice at the table as well, so to speak. Um, so I think that's really important. And I think I just wanted to pick up uh, some Think about actions from before and just um, say yes, actions and intentional action is important. And words can often be just become performative and box ticking in organizations, but words can also matter a lot. And for example, just as a small example of inclus using inclusive pronouns, I think how the language that we use in workplace can also affect a workplace culture and a sense of belonging, especially for people who are from the marginalized community who already feel like they are in the minority. Yeah, no, that's very important. Um, uh, Penny, could I just ask you on this, this question of um, performance? Because I know that you're you're proud of having hit targets for um, uh, kind of gender balance in leadership roles. Um, or, or I think you had a thirty percent target, right, for for, for women in, in senior yeah. roles, which you've hit. Um, have you also monitored any correlation with performance improvement over the similar period? I, I think well, it, uh, it's difficult to tie causal effect in any one business at one component to, to any one change. Um, I think there is a lot of data out there to suggest across a number of businesses and, uh, and so on that, that um, uh, getting a diverse uh, group of people driving decisions um, uh, does make a difference. So uh, I think the one thing I would say is, and I think that business case has been proven a long, number of times in terms of it making a difference. I'm always slightly cautious when we draw back to the business case because I think it has been proven. And even if it hadn't been proven, having 33 women 
chairs and CEOs in the FTSE 250 is just not an appropriate outcome for society. Um, and so uh, uh, I do passionately believe in the business case for a business. Even if I didn't, it wouldn't be the right answer uh, to be where we are. Uh, and so that is, for me, is why fundamentally things have to change. Okay, excellent. And um, we're getting uh, a little trickle of questions coming in now. So I, I just want to um, maybe put, put a few of them to you. Um, maybe one for Keith. Um, uh, one question that asks, I talked earlier about, you know, the importance of inclusion. How can we shift um, people's thinking from uh, inclusion is important to inclusion is necessary or inclusion is vital? Is is there a kind of, uh, maybe Prager will have a view on this, the kind of nudge theory that, that can be uh, that can be used here, but um, Keith or Andor Prager? Yeah, so, so, so I, I, I think it relates to quite a lot of what Penny was saying. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it, it is that improvement in, in performance. But one of the things I think you can do as, 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 a, as, a, as a leader right at the top of the organization is really think about the soft incentives that are in place as well as the financial ones, the one, the soft incentives that are associated with pushing those, uh, those targets on. And I think that's to some extent about and how you champion uh, as you bring through uh, as you bring through uh, you bring through leaders, uh, and it's really important that the people that you are pushing that are being associated with the improving uh, in performance you know, are seen themselves to be uh, inclusive. And I think one of the real challenges we have at the moment is you know it's one thing getting the trap door open through the glass ceiling uh, for uh, the more diverse community. It's another thing actually uh, making sure it remains and that those people are promoted are not blockers and the trap door becomes bigger and easier to, to get through. And I think that's a combination of um, action, uh, behaviors that are, that are monitored and celebrated, but it's also a question, I think, of organizational um, uh, design and uh, and those targets that, that that get in get in place. And you've just got to be relentless about championing championing the right kind of uh, the right kind of people because the organization eventually will get it and move with you. Okay. Um, Prague, I don't know if you want to say something on that, but another one that is definitely for you, um, because you mentioned this, um, a questioner asks, what inclusive pronouns would you advise uh, we use in the workplace? Uh, I think it's really important that we ask people how they identify, because their identity, sense of identity, is really important. So like now, I think we are talking more about names and how pronouncing is really important correctly, because that is a part of somebody's identity. And when it's pronounced incorrectly, a person can feel like they don't, they're not respected or they're not considered important. Similarly, I think we are having really huge discourses and discussions about gender identity as well. So I think it's important no matter what the personal views are, I think it's important in a professional arena for people to ask how they would like to be asked, how they like to be identified. Um, I think as a normative thing, sometimes people fall back on the pronouns he, because that is how a society is structured and our hierarchies work and male becomes a norm. So I think that is really important to use they as a collective pronoun, personally but also it's important for people to know how they self-identify and be able to be a comfortable to be able to say that in a workplace. Excellent. Um, Silke, one, one maybe for you. Um, uh, there's a question that asks, we, we talk about uh, the traits of a charismatic leader, but what, what are the traits of an inclusive leader? Yeah, I, I can very much relate to this question. I, I have to say, um, if you read in the literature about the traits of, of inclusive leaders, 
I always see, you know, a lot of requirements like authentic and humble and vulnerable and 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 then I look at myself and I'm like, oh my God, I'm definitely not an inclusive leader because I don't fulfill all of this at the same time. So I think we, we also have to be a bit careful. Um, I think uh, you're humble, yeah, though. Maybe somebody fulfills all of this. You know, you make it to a charismatic leaders, but most of us will fall short on 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 one of these these dimensions. Um, I I think being being authentic, active listening me is not even a character trait but active listening for me is something which everybody can do even if he might be uh, might have some of the other adjectives not but uh, that that is a basic for all uh, inclusive leaders i i feel that's a, a vital formula yeah um and and penny a, a, a kind of related one for you perhaps um how important is emotional intelligence in um in inclusive leadership? uh it's obviously something that you know you go back 20 years and strong leaders uh would, would have probably seen you know any uh, emotional awareness as a, as a weakness um clearly we've moved on how important would you say it is uh, look I, I think it's critical um uh and it's having and confidence comes in a different form confidence comes in the form to know where your strengths and weaknesses are and to explore others uh, kind of uh, to fill those gaps. But just as an indicator, perhaps, we've just gone through a, a restructuring exercise where we've um, changed the structure in the middle um, with about 1,000 people. And the criteria we have used for leadership there is intentionally around behavior sets and leadership skills ahead of technical skills. And an insurance company, that is quite a brave thing to do and not, not the traditional route for, for getting to senior positions. Um, so that will give you an indicator of how critical that we think it is to lead, especially in a world digitized, changing fast, um, uh, how important that emotional intelligence criteria is. Okay. Um, Keith, I wanted to come back to, 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 to one thing, another thing you said earlier about showing vulnerability. Um, give us a, a, a kind of thought on, you know, what... what it, it, a way you exposed yourself, if that's not uh, an unfortunate phrase, uh, 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 and how you showed vulnerability in a situation and how it paid off. Yeah, I, um, I, I think one of the things that, that, that's been kind of really important during COVID is, as well as all the technical stuff, you know, accepting that there are some broader mental health issues that we have to uh kind of respond res respond to and and actually one of the things that i've been very careful to do whether it's on um you know a weekly reflections piece or or calls is is actually just open up on you know, how tough it, it it it's been you know working working with with the family dealing with the uncertainty, some of the issues that I've had to face. So, you know, making it clear to people that, that, that actually when it's difficult and it, it, it's, it, 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 it's uncertain, you know, it, it, it's all right to feel, and it's not unusual to feel a little bit low and a little bit, uh, a little bit stressed. And then, and then talking to people about, you know, how I deal with the stress and, and, and actually, you know, fantastically, Getting a huge amount of advice from 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 people throughout the organisation about how they cope with it. So getting that conversation going, and 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 you know, you know accepting and being transparent about how difficult this thing is, uh, not just for the organisation but but for me personally and and the impact. I think has been has been quite uh, has been quite important and. Um, it's actually been wonderful the way people rally round because the one of the things is you know the human spirit is 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 magnificent and it comes in all shapes and sizes and that's why we need to be inclusive. Well, on that very optimistic note, um, and with apologies uh, to the women on the panel for finishing with a man's uh, voice, um, I'd like to thank um, thank all of you uh, for a very thoughtful debate um, on this on this crucial topic. Um, thank you to Keith, uh, thank you to Pragya, to Penny and to Silke, um, and uh, I wish you all um, uh, a very good rest of day at the uh, Women at the Top 2020 session. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you.